going to make a bunch of TensorFlow announcements. And... You are absolutely correct. So I saw that I was kicking off yesterday. I'd be happy to hear, hear about it if you attended yesterday. And then I'm OK with ending a little early today. I'm actually in the process of moving. So oh boy. all packed up and ready. <laughs> But, but Charles, did you attend the, the Google I.O. yesterday by any chance? Or Yes. Yeah, I did. Um, yeah. You know, they showed off their quantum computer lab, and um, they're working on, like, this conversational AI where you can converse with objects. Um, like, they <laughs> had a, a, a conversation with a paper airplane and with the planet Pluto. And stuff. It was uh, it was pretty cool. It was interesting stuff. <laughs> I don't know what I'd ask a paper airplane. <laughs> <laughs> and you said today they're doing stuff with TensorFlow. I didn't realize Google was behind TensorFlow. Um, have you used any machine learning libraries before, or anything like that? Um, yeah, I use TensorFlow, TensorFlow all the time. Um, so they're also, I know they made some Firebase announcements yesterday, but um, after like three hours of conference, I can't remember exactly what they were. Uh, they are doing some Firebase uh, presentations today or tomorrow, I think. So I'll, I'll have to ch check in maybe after the fact, but yeah. but yeah, I would love to hear about some of the work you're doing with TensorFlow sometime because it looks like there's good uses, but I've never pinpoint, pinpointed down a particularly good use, um, but I haven't tried, so. I did a project that I located project trees that um, for like, um, for a carbon offset, for, for an application that like um, helped you calculate carbon offsets. And then I did one with, um, um, that detected like fire extinguishers and AEDs and stairwells for like um, uh, for helping people find uh, it exits or emergency equipment during some sort of emergency in high rise buildings. Oh, that sounds really interesting. Yeah, that was a cool project. Yeah, is that something that? Uh, so I, I I didn't know if you're are you more like uh, freelance with your projects or. Um, do you work for directly for a company? I'm a freelancer. That's cool. So you get to see a lot of different cool, uh, cool things coming your way. Yeah. Let's see. And then, uh, how about you, Paul? I heard from you a little bit this past week, and so it yeah. sounded like you were maybe making some progress. Yeah. With so. The yeah. Base. yeah. So thanks. Thanks for that. I appreciate. Um, kind of directed me a little bit there on where to look. So I took about four different data sets. I took about 30 or 40,000 records out of each of those. Um, and then I just threw uh, with my subsets, uh, I just threw those into Access, um, joined the tables together um, per the joins that you were talking about. Um, and Charles, sorry, uh, just to fill you in. So. I was looking to do looking at some of the products to get familiar with the different types of product categories. Um, actually, I could probably share my screen. Um, let's see. Let's see, I don't know which I've not used this before, so let me see. Uh, I can share a tab, a window. I'll try to share a window here. Here. Um, I don't know if you can see this. Let me know if you can see this. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So very simple. I just thought it would be much quicker if I just uh, took my subsets into access. And I, um, so what I was doing was just, um, and this is per Keegan, was um, tying the sales, sales items to inventories and then inventory types because what I, I'm interested in looking at is just to get familiar with the different types of products so I could potentially do my market basket analysis on the different sales products. So um, I joined those together and um, I, don't, I don't know if you guys use Access much. I don't use it very often, but I just thought this would be a quick and easy way to do some things. 
just exploratory type stuff. So you can, once you tie your tables together, you can drag any of the fields down into this screen on the bottom. Um, and then you can just uh, essentially run the result and look at the resulting data set. And so here I've got, uh, I just pulled in sales item ID and name. Um, and then here I've got the intermediate uh, product type, I guess. Um, and then I've got the actual inventory yes. name. So <clears throat> one of the things that I've noticed on here, at least for the, the work that I wouldn't mind doing is uh, intermediate type is obviously very high level. And then you've got these kind of inventory names. Um, but I think these inventory names could actually be subgrouped. Um, so you don't, so if I have something called CBD capsules times 30, there might be in here CBD capsules times 60, which really doesn't, um, it may be too granular. Um, so maybe there's some other, maybe just CBD capsules, right? So I think there might be some subsetting that I might be able to do that would make my analysis a little more meaningful to where it's not so granular. So if, in, as we were talking about last time with market basket analysis, if you buy peanut butter and jelly, you might buy bread. That's kind of the idea. Well, um, you don't necessarily want to know if you're buying Jif peanut butter or Skippy peanut butter, or you may, that may be of interest to somebody. Um, but I think for what I want to do, that may be two grain or so for CBD capsules times 30 and CBD capsules times 60, that's probably too granular for what I'm looking at. So I may end up subsetting these into different groups based on what I see here um, for part of the analysis. But um, so that's kind of what I was doing um, just as a quick and dirty way of just to get familiar with what's there. And I want to continue building out um, the, the tables, pulling them in, taking a sample, and then just pulling into and start creating this, this kind of primary key map that um, I could give you guys and actually give you a whole copy of this if you're interested in it. Um, but to develop this map of the tables, because um, just having this kind of map, a visual representation in one place just gets people oriented to what's there quickly. Um, and I know that, you know, I'm a visual person. So if I see something like this, it's going to stick with me a lot, lot longer if I try to look at a bunch of different code samples and see where all the relationships are. Um, but another thing, um, I was going to ask both of you this question. Um, you know, with the work that you've done with this data in the past, uh, have you considered uh, maybe taking those large tables and uploading them to like something like Amazon Web Services or something like that to where you could actually do your Python development work on your desktop, but then tie into the data from a cloud provider? Good question. So I have made some of the lab results available uh, through Firebase, actually, like Charles was mentioning. So that's, ah, okay. that, that's basically Google's shot at, you know, the, the AWS. So that's Google's version of AWS, essentially. I see. Okay. So I think it's possible for some of the smaller data sets, and that would be awesome. Some of the larger ones like sales, I think it just may be too costly to put them in the cloud. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I've got a friend, uh, David Busby, who runs a company, OpenTHC. And essentially, oh, we've got a new member, but, but hold on, let's, but essentially what he does is he just stores all the data on his computer and just runs it as an SQL for SQL access. And, oh, okay. Uh, Hello, Ivan. Welcome to Hi. the Cannabis Data Science Meetup Group. I think you're muted, Ivan. Well, well Ivan, we're talking about some leaf data sets and how to access it. Um, so essentially, I can point you in the direction of it, um, but David's, you know, tried to 
make some of the data sort of accessible through SQL queries, so mostly like aggregation queries, like totals by day. Um, am, am I still with you guys or am I lagging? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I thought of like putting it on like a local MySQL database or some other open database locally, but yeah, all those cloud services are, are spendy and this is a lot of data. It looks like me have lost Paul, but I can explain when he gets back. What, what was the second part of his question? Um, there was the putting it on the, the cloud, but what was the first part of his question, do you remember? Just wasn't it about like accessing it through like SQL or some or query database queries? Um, ah. uh, well, I don't know. When Paul gets back, we'll have to to ask him. But you know, I like the work he did there by just you know organizing uh, the data into access. So that would be nice to add the rest of the tables because, as we all agree, you know the rule. First rule about data science is, you know, look at the data. So. Oh. This is odd. Um, well, I guess just real quick, um, do you just want to see a, like a dummy variable regression I ran or, or, or what, what are some of the things you're working on, Charles? Or? Um. Lately, I've been working on um, I've been working on this Kaggle competition to like find um, to, to classify radio signals as being like extraterrestrial or just noise, like you know, like um, the example they use is like the Voyager, like the signals that they get from the Voyager, and like how to detect that from just like space noise. So I've been kind of spending the last week doing that. Um, I haven't really worked on cannabis data science since last week, but I, I will get back into it. Although, although what did you say uh, you were working on this past week again? Um, it, it's a Kaggle competition. They have, um, it's to classify radio signals as like, and you try and figure out if it's just like space noise or if it's like a, oh. or if it's like a, if it's like a signal coming from a, a space probe or from extraterrestrials or, uh, but they use like the Voyager, you know, like, like they, they, the example, they give you like, give you example signals from Voyager and what they look like against space noise and how to filter that signal out. And so, so do you know all about the, uh, spacing on the names, but all, you know, the, the tests for white noise, um, like the stationarity test. Is that something that you know about or? No, or I'm just I'm just kind of exploring it right now. I'm just oh. trying to learn well, stuff. Well, for for time series forecasting, like some of the forecasting I showed you, the, the ARIMA and the VAR models, mm -hmm. if you're really doing that rigorously, before you start forecasting, you essentially want to make sure your series is what they call stationary. So it's essentially white noise. So there's no apparent trends or, you know, cyclical behavior or, or anything like that. So, so typically, you know, when you get the data set and you're going to forecast it, you know, a lot, you'd often maybe take the natural log and maybe even the first difference to get it into growth rates. And the whole point of that is to take you know, when you look at most series, right, they're just this trend. Um, like, if, um, so that can, you know, bias your forecasts. So what you do is you basically just difference it um, maybe even a couple times. And that's why it's called ARIMA. That's the I, the integration or the, the difference. Um, and so basically what you're trying to do is you're trying to make the data look like white noise. 
because it's just a theoretical forecasting and one of the assumptions is that you have white noise. So long story short, there's a whole bunch of statistical tests you can do to test if the data is white noise. Um, and so that could be useful in your situation. Okay, oh. thanks. Hi guys, sorry. Uh, my, my wife dropped her calculator on her surge detector that turned off our uh, our uh, uh, our modem. So, or not a modem, but you know, her router. So, bizarre. Well, anyway, sorry about that. Well, yeah, we lost you there for a second. So, <laughs> but to bounce back to your question, so I put some of the lab results in Firebase, which is you know, Google's version of mm -hmm. AWS, just mm -hmm. to sort of make those accessible through an API. I still need to do a bit more work there. The reason I haven't really done it with, say, the sales or inventory is I just think that cost may be exorbitant. Right. And so, like, um, so at OpenTHC, what they've done is they basically just store it on like a server and then they just, do like SQL queries to just do yeah. aggregates. So do daily totals or, you know, total sales by licensee by money. So that's sort of the most accessible the data could get. Honestly, I think there's potential if you thought of a, you know, a cost effective way to store the data and to essentially serve it up through an API or some other means for people to consume it. I think there's a lot of people that would like that data because yes, you can do the public records request, but that's you know a pain. And I think that that's a barrier uh, to entry for a lot of people. Yeah, and I would think that, I mean, it sounds like you've already done your homework in this area, but um, I mean, for the stuff that you want to do with your business, right? You are going to want to have something to where you can uh, append updated data to a centralized location, right, on a regular basis, I would guess. Um, and yeah, I guess the key phrase there that you said is cost effective. Um, so with the Open THC project, do they currently have uh, all the data that you were able to procure? Is that loaded up into their database? Yes, essentially, so actually, David's the one who shared the data set with me. So mm -hmm. they have it there. It's it's a, it's a work in development. So mm -hmm. it may not always be like easily accessible, uh, so to speak. But um, David's done some work to you know make it so you can just get like a JSON dump. I'm not 100 percent sure if. I'll have to, after this call, I'll double check with David and actually share his contact information with you. Oh, thank you. Because that, that's essentially what he's done is just put all this data on his server and he's make, trying to make it accessible through an API. Okay. Um, but like I said, I yeah. don't know the current state of things, but. Yeah, I know I, I could like for these four tables that you walked me through. Um, I, I would, you know, in order to do the complete market basket analysis, I would have to be able to either take all those tables and put them in a location um, through like, you know, Firebase or something. I may have to end up paying for it. I don't know, um, but I'll need Too to much. get that. Yeah, I, I'll need to get the data somewhere altogether that I could uh, that I could query sub, you know, subsets or just make general queries against. Um, but it sounds like, you know, if, if David is, uh, you know, agreeable to it, then maybe I could could pull query data from from his data set. Yes. So I'll get you in touch with him. You may have to kind of uh, what's the phrase? Uh, I don't know. Be the squeaky wheel or something. But you know, just to kind of yeah, you just you, know, you just tell him like okay. You know, because he's, uh, his whole philosophy is, um, you know, not to do a lot of development until there's like an actual need for it, right? So you don't want to be. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I wouldn't want to burden him with anything. I, I, again, you know, however I can get the data 
uh, for this project, for this school project in one place, I guess that's the main driver for me. And if it was temporary, uh, I could set something up a temporary and if, you know, but again, you know, it comes down to the cost effectiveness of it. Um, I definitely can't afford to stand the whole thing up for a bunch of people to, to bang against it, but um, you know, uh, we'll see. Well, yeah, I'll get you in touch because like I said, he's basically just serving it from like his box at, at his office. And I think he's just got it wired up. Essentially yeah, through an API. But, oh. Yeah, under the table kind of thing. Well, I think it's basically the type of thing where you basically just hit his URL with a dot JSON and you'll get a huge data dump. Um, oh, so, I see. But I'll, I'll get you in touch with him because he, that's how I got a hold of a lot of the data myself. Okay. Well, thank are you, you for that. Using, uh, are you using Windows or Mac? Or Me? Linux? Or Windows. Yeah. <clears throat> Windows. Okay. Um, you know, there's, you could use WAMP, which is Windows, Apache, MySQL, PHP. That's, but you could run like a local WAMP server on your PC. Even you can even run it on like a laptop and then have like an external drive and have MySQL database running. Um, and, you know, and, and, you know, just, you know, get some cheap external drive and put it on there. Um, oh, that's a good idea. Like yeah, so do one large download of the data, put it on a, an external drive, and then you're saying run WAMP against that external drive? Yeah, or I mean, you could probably even use, you could probably even write, ex, you could probably put a, an access database on that external drive. Yeah, unfortunately, there's a two gig limit on access. Um, oh, so I think, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so that's then, yeah, one maybe, of the things. Yeah, maybe WAMP. WAMP is okay. free. Or, yeah, WAMP is free, and then there's like a WAMP Pro, but I don't, you probably don't need that. So, Okay, I'll check that out. That sounds like a good alternative, too. Yeah. Yeah, okay. No, thanks for, yeah, thanks for all the advice on that. Sure. So, I guess, like, what type of... I'm just wondering, like, so what would like an, like an example query be, just so I can start thinking about, like, how you, how you need to approach the data? Yeah, I mean, just this initial foray into <clears throat> the access database. I mean, really, it's just a very simple, straightforward select, you know, certain fields from and then joining on the four tables on the primary keys. So very straightforward, simple query. Um, and, and that's really it. I would, I think I'm definitely going to have to, like I say, break down those uh, or create some subcategories of products and create a lookup table. Um, but really, it's the, the query would be very straightforward, very simple. Um, of course, it's going to bring back a lot of data, but um, yeah, it's all very simple stuff. Question. I guess with the market ballot basket analysis, like what's like the like the measure? So is it like yeah. the proportion of items yeah. they bought? We were we were talking about that last time. Um, let me see if I can find something real quick to share with you guys uh, online, and uh, maybe I can talk through it real quick. Um, well, I got to run. I'll see you guys oh, next week. Oh, yeah, Charles, definitely enjoy the IO conference. Tell me how what what's new with TensorFlow because I think there's some good uses for it that I'm missing out on. So I would love to get filled in by uses. Okay, cool. All right, see ya. See ya, Charles. 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 Hey, Key, I'm just gonna look something up. Hey. Um, yeah, maybe, I, maybe I can run you through some of the this very, very actually very simple stuff, and I'm <clears throat> but simple sometimes can be good so that's actually analytics is like that's our one of our philosophies is you know simple is better than complex so. absolutely um maybe this will help i might have to jump around on a bunch of stuff but let me share this uh, with you where are we here where is the meetup 
Here we go. Let's make sure this screen here. Um, and I'll bring this one over. Um, okay, so is this you? Take... This looks fine. Yes. Uh, yeah, I was hang, hang gliding. Uh, yeah, get my <laughs> did you I, get a good thrill for that for sure? Yeah, no, I've I have an aviation background, so I I've always been interested in that kind of stuff. Um, cool. uh, I just stopped, I just pulled this up. It's just it so happened to come up here, but um. Let's see, what would be a good way to just start off with this? Uh, here, maybe. So with all the different combinations of products that you could have, um, you have, this is the left-hand side and right-hand side, or what's called an antecedent and a consequent. And so when you have these antecedents and consequences, you come up with these association rules. So here you got ice cream and soda. Um, you can also have uh, a right-hand side rule that has more than just soda in it. It can have several different things. So you say, what's the relationship between ice cream and this group of products, right? So you can get that relationship as well. Um, <clears throat> but the this most simplistic measure is what you're talking about. It's called support, and it's just proportionality. So how many, how of all the combinations you can have through an, the entire product set, what proportion of this rule, this one at the top, is a, appears in the entire possible set of combinations? So here our support is 0.07%, okay? And this is not unusual um, because there's so many different uh, permutations of the, the association rules. You do get these small percentages, but that's normal. Um, so here you can just say that support is like popularity. So this ice cream and soda is a pretty popular combination. Um, the, I'm going to go over here to lift. Uh, and then I forgot the calculation. Maybe it's in here. But there's another uh, measurement called lift. And lift is really, you can think of it as the strength of association between these two elements in the rule. What's the strength of association between ice cream and soda? Um, so really, if you look at think of this as a two-dimensional plot where you have support on your y-axis, lift on your x-axis, what you want is a product that has high support, in other words, very popular, and the association between those two items in your rule set uh, is also very strong. So you're looking for, in an x-y-axis, you're looking for those data points in the upper right-hand quadrant so they're, they're popular and there's a strong association. Um, those are the two main, those are the two main um, metrics that I would be using. Um, and I forgot what the confidence is for. And there's actually, there's, yeah, go ahead. Can you see what lift was for again? What, what's that capturing? Lift is like the strength of association between the items in the rule set. Mm. So ice cream and soda are strongly associated. So you want a rule that is high in support, which is very popular, but has high lift as well. The association of the rules are very strong. So you can count on that as a, as a very popular, strong rule. And that's, you know, if you get several of these different rules together, you can start thinking about product placement, right? Um, ice cream and soda. So Exactly. So you could have high lift, but low support. So you could have someone, just a couple people get topicals and capsules together every time, but there's only like a small number of people that do that. So that would be mm -hmm. high lift, but low support. Yeah. And what you find is you get a situation where in your X, Y axis, you in the upper right-hand quadrant is where you want the association to be. But what typically happens is hardly anything is up in the, the right-hand, upper right-hand quadrant is almost always empty. And you get kind of this trade-off between support and lift. Um, and so there's a lot of human 
um, decision making that has to go into this. You know, obviously you have to bring a lot of sales context into it, right? Your subject matter expertise of the market um, and utilize this information uh, based on, let's say, your circumstances. So let's say we shared this information with somebody you know it's running a store um, and you share their metrics for their particular store. And you can say, look, there's a lot of customers that are buying these products together. Why not change your arrangement in the store to where you're you're placing them side by side? Um, or maybe you see a relationship that has very strong lift. They're highly associated with each other, but they're not very popular. They don't have as much support, but maybe if you take those two items and display them next to each other, you may actually influence their popularity. So there's a lot of marketing kind of decisions that you could make out of this. You could change the arrangement of a store layout. Um, you could actually um, have promotional coupons or whatever, you know, sales of the, of the week or month or all kinds of different ideas that you could implement within a, a, a shopping setting. Uh, and that's, that's, and this has been around for a very long time. Um, and there's other variants of this approach, but I thought, well, gosh, you know, this is a new data set um, and there might be some opportunities. I mean, if you, you said you were talking about producing white papers and things like this, but from a canalytics perspective, maybe this is a, you know, a service that you could offer to some of your, your customers, or maybe, you know, uh, like maybe uh, there's some, I don't know, maybe there's some sort of inventory type stuff you could do between the people that hold inventory and the things that they're going to um, try to sell to different retail outlets. I don't know. There's lots of ways to think about this. Um, this is this is brilliant, Paul. And like, I love your idea because it's essentially you're taking this, you know, this model, um, this marketing technique analysis that's been around for a long time. And like you said, probably, I mean, maybe either no one or very few people has actually done this with you know, cannabis. Yeah, um, yeah. It's uh, it's like most things in life, right? I mean, here you are, um, you know, tell me about your story and your journey, right? Which is really cool. I mean, you've got a developer's background, but you found yourself in a, a, a completely new industry in um, some of the lab work, right? And so it's that, that combination of interesting intersection points which provides opportunity. I don't think, I'm not a big um, believer in swinging for the fences and home runs. I think those are freaks of nature for the most part. But if you position yourself right in the right kind of circumstances, circumstances you can develop opportunities just by connecting disparate dots. And it's kind of like where you are, right? So, um, and I thought, well, gosh, you know, it, this is a, again, very standard old technique, but hey, let's apply it in a, in a different environment. It's a good idea, and I like your idea about putting it out there for people to use. So what came to mind was essentially almost like a like an online calculator where, I don't know, maybe you know the company could put in their license or what they're trying to look at, but and then it could you know, do this market basket analysis for that licensee. Exactly. So, yeah, they could do it for the licensee. Um, they could have this online calculator that uh, that make, may make suggestions for cross promotional products. Um, yeah, there could be all sorts of different services that you could offer um, electronically. And it sure, is better to develop things and dealing with <laughs> with uh, electronic products like this as opposed to tangible ones, right? There's so much less. Oh, there's a lot less overhead in developing a business that way if you can just deal with the information. So. Uh, yeah, there could be some services. This could act as a service um, to for folks out there, right? Co cross promotional couponing or whatever. But uh, yeah, so that's that's the intent of this thing. Again, it's just a matter of me being able to get uh, all the data that I need that's accessible. That's going to probably be the most work, um, I would think, because after I've got that, um, the actual algorithm is pretty simple to run uh, and then we can generate a lot of different kinds of charts and that's when it starts getting fun when you could just explore right like if uh, let's say you wanted to do 
a regional market basket analysis, right? Maybe there's certain parts of the state that, uh, I don't know, they might um, have certain products that cater to their demographic. I don't know. I think that could, that could be interesting because that is actually something I just heard word of mouth was like, I think the company was talking about like in Illinois or something, how in different towns there, they actually sell different products. So. Okay. Yeah. That seems to make sense. Right. I mean, you definitely have regional products in, in anything. Um, yeah. So, but you know, it's great that you're doing this because having, having, as you well know, having the data centralized in an accessible way for people to get to is, is key to everything. Right. And if you can, in a systematic way, you know, it sounds like that's what kind of the open THC project is trying to do too, but um, to be able to have that all together in one spot um, puts you like right in the hub of everything. Um, you know, and it, as a facilitator and as an enabler, um, you know, to empower people to, to do this type of work. I mean, that's a great place to be. Because exactly, because that's, that is, it was originally for labs, but really anyone came to this industry, that's Kinlytics' philosophy is that if that it can be accessible, it's just going to make everyone's lives better and, yeah. you know, business is going to run better. Absolutely. And, and like you said, like, I mean, technically the data is there, but I mean, as you've found out and as I know, it's not easy to work with. You've got mm -hmm. these giant TSVs that are hard to parse and they're too big to open. And yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think this is going to be a good project to work on. And yeah. I think there's going to be some, well, obviously you're, you're, you know, the last week I've had to look at the data, the little bit I've seen, uh, to your point, it is, yeah, you, you, you just have to know what's going on in there to use it. The only way to do that is to, is to suffer the slings and arrows or map it out, you know, and then, and, and share that with people. But um, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's such an interesting space is that the, what's so exciting about it is uh, and kudos to you is that to get in there, you know, as early as you can and be some of the first people in there because that's where the low hanging fruit is and that's this is an example of low hanging fruit in my opinion right yes. it's something that we can do pretty easily um after we get to the data it's pretty easily and start playing around results and um once we get this set up you could do the same thing and i know i'm going to be using r because i'm just more proficient in r but um you know for your perspective you could use um you know python or uh what's it called what's the the data science package is it scipy or I can't remember what it's called, but you could, oh. you could. Yeah, there's a, there's a couple stats models, but it, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a big fan of it's, you know, your, your weapon of choice. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, you could do the, you could do the equivalent thing of what I'm trying to do if, um, just by, you know, using some simple Python um, models and get the same results and play around with it and make, maybe make those results like you're saying, you know, or make it accessible through an API where people can just run some inputs and get some outputs. Um, that might be the beginning of a, you know, this is an exploratory experience, right? It's uh, just trying to figure out how to get to the data and what we can pull out of the data and whatever you learn from it, you know, that kind of, kind of inform you on directions you want to take as well. I think, I think it's worth pursuing because the data is there, everybody wants it and it just, just slightly out of reach of everybody. And then <laughs> it's just the amount of work you have to put into um, what you've already done, right? Is, you know, through your API calls and uh, through the um, uh, the dictionary object that you, you sent me where you see those relationships, that's the key. Those relationships of how the, everything's tied together, that's the key. And it takes a lot of work to untangle that and, and create that comprehensive picture. And that's, that's the barrier to entry. <laughs> well, I'll, I can help there because it, 
it just took a lot of you know, banging my head against the wall because <laughs> so this was, you know, I approached it from the lab results. And so we had all these lab results that needed to be posted and then like, you know, unhappy clients that were saying, well, where are our lab results? Um, so, right. But it's, it's just a lot there, but like I said, there's a couple like key fields that kind of connect everything together. So, you know, if you know what you're looking for, it's not that um, overwhelming. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I think it, it's worth putting together because like you said, I, I mean, just retailers alone would just have so much value. Plus you've got cultivators, processors, the labs, right. in, independent researchers, you know the, the government body um yeah and there's everyone. one 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 sorry to interrupt you but there's um my last class which was on optimization um there's models that you can develop um for transportation right like mm, optimizing yes. optimizing routes right so if you went to a company and uh they if you could find out i haven't seen the transportation data but if it has point A to point B routes in it, you can create optimization patterns for these companies where they're spending less time on the road. Um, in, so. in, in fact, that's one of the most interesting, that's one of the areas that I find the most interesting. So when I worked at the laboratory, maybe a quarter of it was posting the lab results, three quarters of it was dealing with inventory transfers. So that's Primarily, we were receiving them. Mm -hmm. And so, like you said, it's a scheduling problem. So It's a scheduling so, problem, yes. So at, at labs, they send out couriers. So you'd send out two or three couriers, and they do, I don't know, three to, three to ten stops apiece. Mm -hmm. You know, like you said, you can you can model all of that. So you can do, there's the, the traveling salesman problem with yeah. one driver mm -hmm. and then the vehicle routing problem, which is multiple drivers. And I think that's actually like a classic optimization problem because I don't think it's like, it's obviously not close ended. And you often have to just do a brute force approach where you just calculate the distance between all the routes. Um, yeah. Yeah, some of, the, some of the things that we're using, and we cover this stuff so fast in class that I just barely got through it with the skin of my teeth, but we were using like genetic algorithms to kind of um, hone in on on some of the most likely answers. Um, and we did, we actually went over the, the um, travel and salesman problem several times, you know, so uh, yeah. And maybe, you know, maybe that's not such a great example because you can buy, off-the-shelf software for scheduling, but again, that you could you could still offer that as a service, and based on your experience, it sounds like it's a legit problem. So, but you have to remind yourself, like, I mean, you don't have access to Amazon's data. You know, you don't have access to the UPS's data where they're zipping all over the place. But here, we actually have time-stamped transfers. They have the route. So you have point A, point B, we left at time A. Well, it's estimated. We left at time A, estimated arrival at time B. So, I mean, there's just interesting, like you said, there's low hanging fruit. So you can just do summary statistics, like how many miles were driven? Yeah. Um, like, like that would be a just, an interesting data point. Um, so like, like, yeah, like how many, and then you can just estimate like, you know, how much gas they're spending or who, who knows, but there are transportation companies. And so I don't know the particular questions to ask off the top of my head, but I think it's a yet another case where you've got a unique data set that you just don't find in other industries mm -hmm. and yeah I, I mean to your point with, yeah I mean it, to your point with 
you know, the travel and salesman stuff and the miles driven summary statistics, I'm sure there's probably insurance companies would like to know that who are insuring these, these transporters, right? They mean, they may want to know more, have more detailed information about that. Um, there's so many ways that, I mean, you know, I may be overly optimistic. I'm an optimistic person by nature, but I mean, just, just be ready because, uh, it, looking from the outside view and for the short time that I've known you, it seems like there's going to be a lot of opportunities coming your way. Um, and you're probably going to have to like figure out how to spend your time on the most important ones. But, um, yeah, no, it just, there's tons of opportunity here. Um, and I know there's other people that are jumping into this, well, other people or companies. I mean, I've, I've, you know, what was the name of that analytics company? There's several of them, but there's one that stood out to me. And if I heard their name, I remember it, but, um, the, the, the two big ones are like new frontier data and, um, uh, uh, I kept on seeing Google, I kept on seeing Google searches, but I, I, I remember it, but I mean, obviously there's people that are, you know, ahead in, in this space. Um, but you know, the, the devil's in the details and you're really getting deep into the Washington state data. You're familiar with it. I can see a time in the future where there's probably going to be some big money players that are going to cons want to consolidate all the different states. Um, so they can get that, you know, 360 view of what's going on. And that's where the, I mean, that's where the, the big money I would think would be a big opportunity, but I, I could see that happening one day where, you know, if you're doing pretty well with analytics, I could see somebody that's got like well financed that might knock on your door and go, "Hey, how much do you want to sell analytics for?" Um, you know, I could see that happening. It doesn't it, in any industry. Automotive was like this at the turn of the last century, and and any you know IT different companies. You start off with like tons of little companies, and then there's the col consolidation phase. Um, so yeah, I could see that happening. And. I think you're right. So essentially what you've got now is a shortage of data analytics. Yeah. So everyone needs it. There's a couple players providing it, but they're, it, they can't provide enough. Um, yeah. They're yeah. trying, they're trying their best and they are producing a lot. But like you said, there's so many avenues. Like if you've got somebody looking at, I mean, they're looking at, like demographics, but you know, you're looking at market back market basket analysis. Mm -hmm. um, that's, those are two different analyses. Um, right. and then if you toss in, you know, logistics, that's a whole nother ballpark. Uh, so. Yeah. And that's, I mean, these are all huge areas, right? They're all huge segments of, of this whole process. There's what's great about the seat to sale process is it's just a, an immense, supply chain, really it's a supply chain, right? Um, and there's just so much opportunity in, in that space. So, uh, uh, you know, I was gonna ask you based on your your history in the labs, um, have you ever come across people that propagate from, uh, it's basically from a cell cutting from a plant and they grow them in like, kind of like, is it algar and like a, these Petri dishes? Uh, Ooh. It's like stream, go ahead. So, so you mean like like clones? So we yeah. just take things of the plant? Well, not, so, a snip, not a snipping of the plant and then you just prop, you know, propagate it in some root nutrients. But um, I, I've heard that some people can actually take cell samples from the plants from like some place, certain place on the stem, put them in a Petri dish with this algar kind of growing medium and then the cells will grow and a plant will start to grow. And the idea is that um, any kind of viruses and other types of things are left behind in this process because mm. it's done in a sterile environment. Um, so you can maintain your strain without bringing all the baggage along. I guess that's kind of, I, I don't know if you've heard of that. I just, I stumbled onto it and I was like, oh, that sounds interesting. Look, that, that's, that's an incredibly interesting technique. I haven't heard of that, but like you said, I think I wouldn't be surprised if people are doing that because people are getting yeah. quite innovative. They're also a little secretive about those uh, <laughs> yeah. things. 
So right. I think if someone yeah was using like that technique, they may not mm -hmm. um, be telling everybody. Um, I at the lab we primarily had people just asking questions about like you know different extraction techniques. So that's well a lot of like sort of like the the scientists who are doing the chemists they're looking for the the most efficient caught like cost efficient and highest yield extraction techniques okay um, that's the processors and i actually haven't heard too much about the cultivators like i said i think it may be because they're kind of guarding these secrets yeah. because from what i've heard it's like growing knowledge is actually kind of rare so you have a lot of people kind of seeking like a like a head grower like a head cultivator and like i guess everybody you know claims that they're like an expert sure it's really it's really tough to you know find people that actually know what they're doing so yeah yeah and i know that here in michigan um there's such a large black market that's starting to now come into the sunlight and you get a lot of more legit businesses that are starting to bubble up. Um, and it's, it's the right now in the last 18 months, it's been crazy. Um, just talking with my brother-in-law who's in, involved in the business as for what little I know about it, I've heard through him. And uh, you get so many facilities that are popping up like mushrooms now. Um, and these, some of these people are pretty well financed. To, to get into this, um, but oh. the, the businesses, so let me give you a little bit of background on Southeast Michigan. The most, the largest community that's getting involved with this, they're called, it's called the Chaldean community. So there's a large Middle Eastern population here in Southeast Michigan. Like for example, my wife is, is Jordanian, right? So there's a lot of, a lot of people from the Middle East here, they came to the auto, to work in the automotive industry. Um, and what's happened is in following generations, they're more of like a like a merchant class uh, of people where they do they have a lot of restaurants, gas stations, this sort of thing. So they a lot of these folks are well financed, have their own businesses, and saw this as an opportunity to jump in. So the Chaldean community owns a, the vast majority of the operations in Southeast Michigan. And but here's the thing. Um, they don't have the level of sophistication of the things that you and I are talking about. They, they would have no idea about this type of thing. And as these businesses become more and more mainstream and legit businesses, which that's where it's all going, there's going to be for the things that you're talking about, like making things easier for people with compliance. Um, there's going to be a lot of opportunity, I think. And you probably already, you know, you've already experienced it with uh, based on what you've told me. So that's happening here. It's going to happen everywhere. Right. Uh, so it's just a matter of, um, again, low hanging fruit, which things seem to be the most important. Exactly. Because like you said, there's, you know, there's entrepreneurs, business owners, they're, they're trying to set up shop and yeah, they, they need people that they, that they have a bit of experience and mm -hmm. they have some yeah. knowledge to share. Just you, just your knowledge on your lab expertise. Um, I bet you could probably hang a shingle out and make your, and people in Southeast Michigan would want to consult with you. I, I guarantee it. Um, so, go ahead. What, what would they want to consult about? Do you think? I think the, the most basic question, how do I pass the test? Right. What things should I be looking for? Um, uh, yeah. How do I set up my operation to where I can get my certifications done. I mean, that's the most basic, basic question, right? So, um, and you could advise them on, well, I have this five-step plan or whatever it is, right? Based on your experience, these are the things that people mostly do not pass on and the reasons why. That you could, for an hour of consultation, you could charge a thousand dollars or something, right? It's not, it wouldn't be unusual to charge those types of fees. I don't think, because um, these people, uh, a lot of these people uh, have the money to do that. So, um, you know, so just think about it. Um, just think about it. I mean, it might be an extra, another revenue stream for you or something. And if I could help you, I'll let you know. Um, I could, I could talk to my brother-in-laws and put it out there that there's um, a lab expert that I know. And if 
if anybody you know if he's looking for consultation or specific questions he's a good person to talk to definitely i could definitely help out so those are some of the things i know about i've seen my i've seen my fair share of failures i i know i know the pain points of the producers and processors and, yep. and generally can help just make things go a little easier and then the, the sugar on top is you could also back it up with data because you could actually look at say washington data and actually show mm -hmm. them okay you know these are the failure rates in washington maybe these are the failure rates in california you know this is this is about what you should you can expect or right and you could say these are the failure rates and these are the reasons why they did fail and this is what you could do to mitigate those risks um really yeah to, a total consulting gig yeah oh, that's brilliant paul you're Got a lot of ideas. <laughs> <Lots> of <laughs> ideas. Well, I mean, you just uh, yeah, you're in the right spot, man. I mean, that's it's a good uh, good spot to be in, I think. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I'll talk to my brother-in-law and feel uh, feel him out. If, you know what the demand would be for something like this, and then next time we'll talk, I'll just kind of hit you up, or I'll just send you a note or whatever um, to find out if it seems like it would be a viable thing. Uh, and then you could say, well, if, if something I want to do, what kind of evidence presentations, uh, you know, other kinds of things that I could use as consulting information. Uh, and maybe you could do a test run. You could do a test run with my brother-in-law or something and say, if you're trying to get, yeah, I mean, then, then it's a, a no harm, no foul. And you can fumble your way through it and totally bomb it. It won't matter. You're just learning. So. Um, and that, could he be good, okay. that could be a good experience because I could you know, hear what you know, what questions he has to, to ask and yeah. to do my best to answer. Yeah, exactly. So maybe that's something we could do just to, yeah, we should, we should do that. Um, even if it was a totally informal and I got you guys together just to chat for half an hour, um, you would learn about the Southeast Michigan market. Mm -hmm. Um, and he would learn from you on things that he could do from, uh, so he's got a, a, what do you call it? Um, a caregiver grow operation is what he's got. Um, so, um, and I know he wants to grow and literally grow, grow his operation and get some licensing, but in order to do that, he's got to learn about how to get, you know, passed from the state. So, um, it could be a mutually beneficial thing. So. That's something to think about. Definitely. Uh, I'm all aboard because that's what I'm here to do is help and share my knowledge with other people in the industry and so that they can yeah. they can run their businesses better. So I'm all Absolutely. aboard. Absolutely. And don't 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 forget, you know, if uh you know if, if this starts if these different areas uh, start to become promising for you, make sure you you get paid for it. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> that's the first thing. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. So, but anyway, all right, well, I'm going to have to uh, probably just, uh, bolt here. Yes, um, I, I've, I've got a, a full day ahead. So thank you, Paul. Yeah. Awesome ideas. Yeah. It's always awesome talking with you. And I'll stay in touch because I think what you've lined out in Michigan is promising. And we've got a lot of promising work ahead with this data set. And yeah, it analysis. sounds... Right. It sounds really fun. I'm looking forward to it. And uh, good luck with your move today. Definitely, Paul. Thank you. And All right. Have an awesome day. I'll talk to you later, Keegan. Bye Take now. care. Bye-bye. You too. Bye.